Welcome to the Dark Whales Tours podcast with me, Matthew Rose. Picture the scene, a ship sailing in the open waters. It is a beautiful sunny day. The wind is in your hair and there is nothing ahead of you but open ocean. Suddenly the air changes, the atmosphere takes a sinister turn. The clouds hide the sun and you see a ship coming in fast. At first you don't think much of it. But then you notice the flag, the legendary skull and crossbones, they are coming for you. We are all familiar with the infamous exploits and adventures of pirates from all over the world. They have even found their way into some of the world's most beloved works of literature. Wales has its own share of infamous pirates that have made their mark on history and even influenced how we view the classic pirate of fiction. On this episode, we will look at the infamous exploits of two of the more notable names from Welsh history, as well as exploring some of the smugglers that have been plaguing the Welsh coastline for centuries. We will also be looking at a Welsh ghost ship that started a mystery that has never been solved. Wales has been the birthplace to numerous pirates privateers and smugglers throughout the ages, including the infamous Bartholomew Roberts, the most feared pirate in his day. However, none are arguably more famous than the man behind the famous rum, Captain Henry Morgan. Henry Morgan was born in 1635 in Llan Rumney, near Cardiff. He was born to a relatively prosperous farming family. However, his rise to prominence as Lieutenant Governor of Jamaica stems from the English Civil War. His father's brothers were on opposing sides during the Civil War, and it is thought that in 1654, Morgan, serving under Oliver Cromwell's parliamentarian command, was part of an army sent to the Caribbean to attack the Spanish. Morgan at the time was a junior officer in Cromwell's army, and an expedition to sack Santo Domingo was a failure, which saw Morgan's attention turn instead to Jamaica. After the expedition took Jamaica, Morgan decided to settle there to try and seek his fortune. It helped matters greatly for him, of course, due to the fact that after the restoration of the monarchy, his uncle, Colonel Edward Morgan was named the Lieutenant Governor of Jamaica by King Charles II. In the early 1660s, Henry Morgan took command of his first ship as a privateer. A privateer was licensed by the Crown to attack the Spanish fleet on behalf of England. Morgan's fame and fortune continued to grow, with a number of successful raids against the Spanish under his belt. His achievements didn't go unnoticed, as he found himself named commander of all Jamaican forces, with nearly 2,000 men and numerous ships under his command. However, in 1671, Morgan led an expedition to raid Panama City, one of the wealthiest cities of Spanish America, and indeed the world. Morgan's fame preceded him, because although he was largely outnumbered by the Spanish, Morgan won the day, as many of the Spanish forces fled, which allowed Morgan to take the city fairly easily. The only trouble was, shortly before Morgan set out on his expedition, a peace treaty had been signed between England and Spain. Word hadn't reached Morgan of this, so his actions in Panama were not lawful and deemed as piracy. As a means to appease the Spanish, King Charles II had no choice but to send an arrest warrant out and brought Morgan back to London under charges of piracy. This was far from the end of Henry Morgan's story. In a quirky twist of fate, England was now once again at war with Holland and unrest began to stir in the Caribbean. Many of the remaining privateers there were beginning to feel uneasy and were unsure what to do. The king was reluctant to punish Morgan. 
Instead, an amazing turn of events occurred. Morgan was knighted by the king and sent to Jamaica with the title Lieutenant Governor as a means to once again command and keep rule under the empowerment of the king. Sir Henry Morgan spent the rest of his days in Port Royal, living a relatively peaceful life, dividing his time between his new political works and of course drinking rum with his friends and privateers. He died in 1688. The exact cause of his death is not known for certain. It is thought, however, that Henry Morgan's spirit did not stay in the Caribbean after death. His ghost is said to walk the halls of Clanrumney Hall, the alleged place of his birth. He has been seen in one of the upstairs rooms that is now used as a conference room. Beneath Llanrumney Hall, there is a series of caves that some say were used by smugglers to get their contraband all over Cardiff. These caves and passages were also said to be the home of spirits and the echoes of their footsteps have been heard when there has been no one around. One of the other Welsh pirates that has been remembered in popular culture is none other than Bartholomew Roberts or Bart Roberts for short, who is one of only five real-life pirates to be named in Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, and also inspired events in the film franchise Pirates of the Caribbean. John Roberts, who would later be known as Bartholomew Roberts, was born in 1682 in Little Newcastle, in between Fishguard and Haverford West. John Roberts is mentioned as being a pirate quartermaster and captained his first ship in 1718. The following year, the captain of the infamous House of Lords died. This was the council of leading pirates that maintained order throughout the pirate world. This was the inspiration for the council of pirates in the third Pirates of the Caribbean film. Very different, of course, to the House of Lords we are all familiar with in British politics today. John Roberts was elected to replace the pirate captain of the House of Lords, and upon his election, he took the name Bartholomew Roberts. Captain Roberts' first major raid occurred off the coast of Brazil, where he managed, in the dead of night, to capture two Portuguese ships full of treasure. With the gold coins he had captured, Bartholomew Roberts was able to buy fancier clothes and was known to wear crimson silk from head to toe with a scarlet ostrich plumed hat and probably also influenced the look of a famous fictional pirate, Captain Hook. Hook also has Bartholomew to thank for the name of his ship as Captain Roberts' French enemies used to call him Le Jolly Rouge which in English means the pretty man in red, though when saying it in French sounds more like the famous name Jolly Roger. Over three years, Captain Roberts is recorded to have taken over 400 prizes across the Atlantic, the coast of Africa and of course the Caribbean. In his time he was more well known than Blackbeard and was famed as the Great Pirate. He was not afraid of attacking ships that belonged to Spain, France, Portugal and even England, whereas most other pirates would flee from ships belonging to such powerful countries. Robert's next impact in the world of pirates came out of a betrayal. Captain Roberts had sailed his ship, the Royal Rover, to Devil's Island to celebrate his latest victory. During the voyage, he sighted a brigadine, which is a small two-masted ship. Roberts decided to take only 40 men to chase it away, leaving the Royal Rover and its treasures in the hands of Walter Kennedy, a trusted member of his crew. Captain Roberts was away at sea for eight days. By the time he returned to Devil's Island, Kennedy had sailed away with the Royal Rover and all its treasure. In order to prevent anything like that happening again, 
Captain Roberts drew up a new pirate's code to ensure respect and order among pirates. These 11 codes outlined the actions and conduct of all crew while at sea and also ensured that every man had an equal share of any treasure, food or drink that was taken. What these codes show is that even though the popular idea of pirates is of rogue crews who are only one step away from mutiny, in reality they were a very democratic society, every man having a vote as to the affairs of the moment. Lights out at 8pm and no man was ever to strike another while at sea. Captain Bartholomew Roberts went on to attack and capture countless vessels, becoming the most famous pirate in the world and also the most feared. He also designed his own flags, which when raised on his ships struck fear in the hearts of those who saw it and usually ensured a quick surrender. On the 9th of February 1722, Captain Roberts and his crew captured the vessel Neptune and his crew celebrated through the night. The next day the HMS Swallow caught up with them and in an ensuing battle Captain Roberts was killed as he stood on the deck. His crew then wrapped his body in sailcloth and weighted it with chains and threw it overboard. Such was his fame that the governors of colonies from the North Americas and the Caribbean to Africa and India wrote letters giving thanks for the death of Bart Roberts, who had nearly brought transatlantic trade to a standstill. His reputation was solidified when in 1724 Daniel Defoe, going by the name Charles Johnson, wrote his book A General History of Pirates. For this he was able to interview some of Robert's crew and wrote the accounts of Roberts runs to a greater length than that of any pirate, because he ravaged the seas longer than the rest, having made more noise in the world than the others. Though maybe not as well known today as some of his pirate brethren, he has however inspired many more fictional pirates that we all know today. For example, the iconic image of Captain Hook, the Pirates Code and Pirates Council in the Pirates of the Caribbean films, and also being honoured in the film The Princess Bride, in the guise of the character the Dread Pirate Roberts. Captain Bartholomew Roberts began his life in a small Welsh village and ended it as the most infamous pirate of his day. Henry Morgan and Bartholomew Roberts were both feared and respected during their lifetimes and in the centuries since they have both found their way into popular culture, whether it be selling world-renowned rum or being the inspiration for fictional pirates. These two men have shaped the way that pirates are thought of all over the world and even though their deeds are of a questionable nature, they are part of Welsh history. Two Welshmen who certainly left their mark on the pirating world. The infamous lives and exploits of pirates around the world has fed our imagination for decades. From a young age we are often drawn to the intrigue and seemingly tantalising lives of these rogue characters. They have provided literature and film an almost ready-made villain, a character that we love to hate. They have also created the ability to terrify us in equal measure, especially when you add the supernatural into the mix also. Ghost ships and stories of lost souls at sea have been synonymous with myth and legend the world over. There is actually a case of a Welsh ghost ship that is a mystery still unsolved. The ship has been nicknamed the Welsh Marie Celeste. The ship's name was the Resolvan and it sailed out of Aberystwyth to Canada with a cargo of timber and cod. On the 29th of August 1884 the Resolvan was spotted adrift off the coast of Newfoundland, Canada 
by the vessel HMS Mallard. After the Mallard tried and failed to get a signal from the Resolvan, the captain decided to send a boarding party on board. The boarding party reached the ship and upon boarding they found nothing. No crew, no captain, they had completely vanished. There was no sign of disturbance or violence. The fire in the galley was still lit and there was still food lying on the table. The only things missing from the Resolvan was one lifeboat and a stash of gold coins that belonged to the captain, John Jones. This stash was valued at £300, an estimate of roughly 37500 in today's money. The crew were never found, but a few days later, however, two brothers found a body of a man wearing a captain's uniform on Random Island, just off the coast of Newfoundland. The body didn't have any identification or belongings except for a golden watch. He was sat under a tree facing the ocean. The brothers at the time didn't report their find to the authorities and buried the body themselves. When they returned to their families, they had become quite rich, but refused to tell anyone how they had made their wealth. The brothers' find may never have been revealed had it not been for the youngest brother's granddaughter coming across an article written by the great-grandson of John Jones, the captain of the Resolvent. The lady contacted John Jones' great-grandson and told him of the story that had been passed down through her family of her grandfather and his brother's find. John Jones may have been discovered, or rather his body was found, but to this day none of the crew have been located and the cause of John Jones' death is still a mystery. It is not just abandoned ships that dead pirates leave behind. It seems it is their ghosts as well. One ghostly pirate that is said to haunt the Welsh coastline is the spirit of John Paul Jones, an American pirate who fought in the War of American Independence. He is also often credited with founding the American Navy. John Paul Jones would often be found sailing around Colody Island off the coast of Tembe. He would engage in piracy and become infamous in the area. He would use a crevice in the rocks near Old Point on Colody Island, the same hideout that Captain Morgan used. It was also this crevice where, in 1792, John Paul Jones' body was pushed so he would forever be among his treasure. A treasure, it seems, which he is still looking for. On cold, dark nights, the sound of digging can be heard coming from the beach, known as Paul Jones Beach. It is said the ghost of John Paul Jones is still looking for his treasure, digging the beach every night. Pirate ghosts have captured our imagination and are occasionally used as villains in books and film. John Carpenter's classic 1980 movie, The Fog, instilled fear in viewers as it told the story of an eerie fog bringing with it a crew of vengeful mariners hell-bent on vengeance. Of course, there are also the undead pirates that prowl the seas in the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. We are fascinated with tales of the unknown and the secretive actions of pirates and smugglers. North Wales, for example, was known as a smuggler's paradise in the 18th and 19th century. The reason is of a practical nature. In those days, the Isle of Man was not officially part of Britain and therefore out of the jurisdiction of the British authorities. The smugglers would store their contraband on the Isle of Man and then ferry them to North Wales in order to spread them across the rest of Britain. One such smuggler was William Owen of Ceredigion. In the early 18th century, William was known as a vicious cutthroat and a rogue. By his own admission, he had killed at least 
six men. He was known to use Llyn Beach to bring his goods to land. William Owen was eventually caught and hung in 1747. There were some smugglers that used South Wales to hide their contraband also. John Knight, for example, sailed around the sea in his ship, the John Coombe, where he terrorised the Bristol Channel in a ten-year period between 1780 and 1790. Knight's base was on Barry Island, back in the days when it was actually an island. The pirates who called Wales home were able to make a name for themselves beyond these shores and impact the world in many ways. Such was their impact that we are still talking about them today and they are still influencing the way we look at pirates. If you have your own story to share on this or any of the other topics in our podcasts, then please email us on darkwales at hotmail.com. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Dark Wales Tours podcast. Please be sure to like and share this episode and please also follow us on our Instagram, Facebook and Twitter feeds. Be sure to listen to the other episodes of this podcast. Diochen Vaur, thank you very much. The Dark Wales Tours podcast is produced and delivered by Matthew Rose and Luke Orcock, owners of Dark Wales Tours.